What's the topic today, Patty? Uh, the topic of today is, um, uh, I don't know the exact title right at the moment, but sacred space, sacred ground, sacred yeah. ground, that we're linked and the lineage connected with the link. Um. <coughs> <clears throat> so, uh, sacred space is, um, we call it sacred because we are creating a special space here, um, just in the gompa, in the meditation hall. Um, uh, also, there's a, a sacred uh, space in the dojo where we did some um, recovery group and meditation. <clears throat> sacred means we've created a special environment so that we can um, wake up and be sane and be compassionate. And as I said earlier, also be fundamentally safe. <clears throat> Buddha Dharma is for training to be in the real world. Um, and we're very aware these days that the real world <laughs> uh, is not safe, isn't that so? Those of us who grew up with trauma in their lives, we knew that really early as youngsters, didn't we? But uh, we can't train uh, in an unsafe environment very easily. So uh, we can't just, I say, you know, sometimes to students, you, you can't fix the engine when it's running. I don't know, maybe you can, <laughs> maybe the metaphor doesn't work, but I don't think so. <clears throat> so we do have to create special environments for people to train and learn things and learn skills, an environment that intensifies the ability to concentrate, to um, be relational, to hear uh, and learn, and to do it in, in a safe way, uh, which, which includes you know, being challenged, right? So sometimes uh, people are aware, sometimes I talk about my um, martial arts training with Robert Nakashima, who I meet with a couple of days a week in the dojo. Um, so now I've known Robert for maybe, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. It took a while to feel safe around him. He's very traditional. <laughs> I'm not always friendly, you know, um, which is different than not being safe. But um, gradually, um, you know, I saw, because I've trained with other martial arts teachers, um, so I have some idea who's genuine, who's not, or who's not maybe my teacher, put it that way. Um, so when I'm training with Robert now, I feel completely safe. However, that doesn't mean I don't feel challenged. That's the distinction. So um, safe means I know that the environment there is for my to learn and to be my best artist, and that this person, uh, the Sifu, the Sensei, is like just totally there, totally committed to uh, me and having it work. But that doesn't mean Robert's not going to say like stupid. You know, something that's very, don't do that, or wrong. Uh, and in traditional dojos to test you, they're, they're going to, you know, there's going to be some physical stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> and particularly um, uh, when I've trained in uh, knives and swords with Robert, that, that's the real, not real thing. I mean, we're, we're aware of each other. So we're not really trying to stab each other, but has anybody ever done knives or swords in a real way? Yeah, you have to really feel totally safe. You have to be totally present. You cannot be spaced out. You know, you have to learn, but you don't really want to hurt the other person, right? But even so, sometimes I wear like arm guards. <laughs> yeah, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, if you really want to learn how to survive a street knife fight, then uh, you really have to train, right? It's not, it's not like, um, 
You know, it's not uh, West Side Story where they're dancing knife fights right now. <laughs> like that. So it's very street. <clears throat> so for me, the training isn't, I don't want to have knife fights, but I, I have to be fully present and I'm going to notice right away when I'm not paying attention, right? Because you get instant feedback, it's instant karma, you know, not only from myself, but from Robert or something. So, but there are rules, right? You know, you bow in, you bow out, you ring a bell, you know, if you say time out, it stops, right? You know, we don't, it's not a, still based on agreement, right? Like that. Um, but it's very, it's very alive that way. So that's a sacred space. So we have like, uh, especially um, blessed uh, bodhisattva there are called fudomyo, um, Japanese version of achala, uh, immovable, right? So flaming sword and one fang here and one fang going up. Yeah, very immovable. Um, that is that eighth level bodhisattva we say in our tradition. So there's a whole bunch of meanings to immovable means non-distraction, but it also means not uh, moving away from bodhicitta, not giving up uh, the uh, aspiration to be fully awake to benefit others and free ourselves, right? Not wavering. So <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of Fudomyo uh, statues and caves in Japan. It's quite beautiful. So without this sacred space and Wataru came and did a ceremony. So it's like, it not only it's there to train, but also then we make a dedication to each other. Like we're gonna do this thing and we're not gonna let it die, right? That is an additional sense of sacredness. We're gonna pass it on. We're not just gonna go, well, that was Adam, you know? So uh, not that is a further sense of sacredness. It's a safe, dynamic place to see the truth, but also we make commitments to each other and we make commitments to uh, pass it on like that. So without that, you know, it still can, with, it still has a sacred space in a sense, you know, that a beautiful or um, many great teachers like here have visited. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, recently a few teachers have come uh, even former abbot of our a monastery in India, and uh, so, and Kenshin Rinpoche, of course, and um, our friends, and they went, whoa, kind of like, yeah, this is the second time the abbot, former abbot's been here, I was, whoa. I had no idea how many people have visited this center. Just, you know, like, has been everywhere around the world, right? You know, it's like this is sacred space. So that's the meaning of Ling. You know, if we say Dona Dargi Ling, you know, Dona Dargi means like um, on the spreading of the union of Sutra and Tantra in our school, we see them as a union. Um, Ling means, um, you know, this is like, oh, this has gravitas, right? So, um, uh, this is going to continue. Of course, we um, we have a few board members here, so we do have to, you know, pay our note. We have to keep the um, lights on <laughs> and uh, maybe put in a new roof, you know, something like that. Um, <clears throat> hopefully not this season, but uh, and we put a new fence, you know, so that, but this spot is never going away. Do you get it? As long as like the sky and earth and rivers, this is how the, the lineage thinks. This is like, this is sacred space. This is not like, oh, we're going to just kind of, well, that was nice, now we're leaving. No, no, this is like, you know, like they're very sacred pilgrimage places um, in India. Um, you know, the most famous one is like Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha um, woke up. There's, um, uh, you know, some of the ruins of the main monasteries like Nalanda. Um, there's uh, the Deer Park, Sarnath, 
so forth is you know, uh, uh, there are like Padmasambhava's cave in Nepal and of course places in Tibet where it, it might be overrun by tourists <laughs> uh, but uh, it might be noisy like Bodh Gaya but like it, we're not going to build condos there right we're, we're going to preserve it so um, yeah so th this uh, Dona Dargi Ling this temple has like continuity right so uh, I'm not worried but I'm going to keep adding energy to it right but uh, it felt really good that you know it's like um, these teachers wonderful I call them the A plus, li a plus level <laughs> so uh, they go no hey this is this is happening here the energy here is fantastic really so um on a personal level that um you know actually i like hearing that because sometimes uh people are going well you're not doing this right llama you're not doing that right and then my codependency is yeah maybe i'm not doing it right you know <laughs> so <laughs> i think oh god i'm not doing it right you know but uh yeah then you know i'd go yeah of course you know it's actually fantastic really we can do things better we can do more precision more uh, uh, organization in a good way but it's got to be organic it's got to be sacred organization corporate just corporate organization um, American corporate style is transactional right you know it's, it, we're not that's another aspect of sacred this is not transactional space it isn't like um, you know we're doing this just to get this or it's not dharma club dharma club is my rant as a few people in the room know like people say well what am i gonna get um do i get a discount on retreats because i'm a member <laughs> you know <it's> like, <laughs> no you're supposed to give more what, what do you mean discount <laughs> americans now like well what, what's you know what do you offer and of course we do offer programs which i'm very proud of <laughs> but, you know, this is like going to 12 step, you know, people, well, what do I get out? Well, you get to you get your freaking life back is what you get, you know, so that's, that's what we're, we're doing here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the system here, we could should call it um, our uh, management system should be called interdependence, right? Or interdependent independence we need people to be acting independently but also as as part of um uh, a tribe like that it's hard to do because the tendency in work and government is very um if we just have everybody's job description tidy and the flow charts tidy um but you know how how do people feel in general government and business is working right now? Not so great, probably. You know, it's working in some degree. Yeah, so we still have some freedoms and we still have some social services. Um, but it's it's been hurt, don't you think? So the human connection. So the most important thing for sacred space is the human connection like that. And when I say human connection, actually, we also mean connection with all the six realms. So in our tradition, um, we um, experience or believe or um, know that there's um, aliveness and sentience and all different kinds of creatures, uh, seen and unseen. Um, most people that I like now, uh, you know, see that animals are intelligent, right? Mm -hmm. Where <laughs> um, maybe a couple hundred years ago, or be, you know, like they just dumb animals, you know? They say it was like um, Anne Sewell's Black Beauty that helped, that novel that helped bring about um, uh, 
uh, in England, uh, um, you know, seeing animals is actually having feelings, right? You know, so uh, it wasn't too long ago, maybe just a little over 100 years ago, that in this country, like, uh, females weren't seen as smart enough to vote. When, when did the vote come in? Someone should know. 23, 20, okay. So, you know, so in our tradition, we see there's a lot of intelligence in the universe. There's a lot of stupidity too, but we recognize that there's more, when we say interdependence, there's more going on than us. There's the environment, there's all kinds of different beings. So when we say sacred yeah, um, in traditional Dharma, then we also see as all the, uh, archetypal energy represented by the archetypal Buddhas on the wall and all our past teachers are still present with us, right? That's sacred. That's another quality. Like, sacred would be, well, they're dead. And yeah, Siddhartha, Shakyamuni Buddha's body is dead, but the, uh, the truth is still with us, right? So we say Shakyamuni is still with us or our teachers are still with us and we're still with them because we're living the truth. So it's sacred. So it's that kind of view um, like that. <clears throat> so I want to stop here and, and maybe see if I'm making any sense. Uh, we can have discussion, uh, questions and comments. La, la, la. Oh, yeah. And then we need to, if there's a microphone, then we need to pass the microphone. Yeah, so like that. There is a thing with the microphone. You actually have to have it kind of right, right next to you. Yay. Thank you, Lama. Uh, yeah. Something occurred to me when you were talking about feeling safe in this space, which is very easy to do in this space. It's very yeah. easy to feel like it's a safe, sacred space. But you made a comment to the effect of it's hard to train if you don't feel safe. Yeah. And I wondered about our home training and yeah. the training opportunities we offer for our family members and our children, you know, not necessarily lineage training, but training in general and beyond physical safety, which right. in some households doesn't exist either. How do you make your household with your family members feel safe and maybe a bit sacred too, especially when you have family members that aren't necessarily practicing the same lineage, you know, tradition that we see? How do I make it safe, for, feel safe for my 20 year old? How do I make it feel safe for my visitors? That sort of thing. Wondered if you had any comments you could offer about that. Even though that's a really good question, um, I'll start this way. Even though the Buddha taught meditation um, to fairly high functioning people, a lot of his original students were part of the aristocracy, right? They're already disciplined people. Um, he took on some interesting people too, but he found you had to make a lot of rules. <laughs> You can't just say, okay, um, you know, just sit quietly, uh, pay attention to your breath, notice your mind, and uh, eliminate craving and confusion, you know. Um, he found when you got people together, you really needed to make agreements and um, have, have schedules and regulate things like that. Um, and the problem sometimes with families is it's, it's highly organic because, um, you know, you just have the life force there. So um, usually a lot of times with families, unless people start out uh, right away being very clear or being, you know, the best parents on the planet, we usually have to do kind of backfill or something. <laughs> you know, I'd go, oh, that didn't work. So, um, but, uh, you know, in addition to the love and compassion and awareness, um, you know, we have to have lots of agreements and, and good boundaries. Um, and that can be very challenging to um, introduce, you know, after kind of, you know, the horses ran run out of the barn. But it has to be done. And, and actually, it's the way the Buddha did things. I mean, he was not really into rules. Um, 
So some, something kind of crazy had to come and then he'd say, well, that's not a good idea <laughs> to do that. So I'm gonna make it, you know, some kind of rule. And, um, you know, their basic rules, you know, we call the precepts, right? So, um, you know, that's why when we do a refuge ceremony here, people, um, you know, take, they say, they aspire to fulfill the precepts. You know, it's not a black and white thing, you know, for saying we're not killing or stealing or lying or uh, physical misconduct or intoxicant misconduct. Then and that's pretty basic, right? You know, but um, we have to continue to, to work on it. So some agreements are really hard to make, you know, where, um, uh, you know, people and families are actively drinking and using and there's just this like craziness, right? Um, so you have a dysfunctional family or, or people are physically, um, you know, violent, you know, so uh, and my family is more like you know, real bipolar kind of confusion, you know, just what is reality, you know, um, which can be equally destructive, like you don't know how someone going to be today, right? Um, or what the, you don't know any rules, or there's all kinds of things like that. But usually with families, we have to reintroduce flexible things. You know, once a year, we, we actually have to have family meetings and, um, be kind of left brain about it sometimes. And this is what, here's what's working and here what isn't and, and, and make agreements like that. Um, uh, the uh, you know, family dynamics are uh, um, intense and even the Buddha had um, difficult family dynamics. So we also have to be um, we have to understand that. So, um, when, when I'm, if I have time to talk to other teachers or senior students, um, of course I talk about like yesterday with Geshe Tenge about here's our programs and here's what we do. Um, but maybe next time I see him in two weeks, we have lunch. Uh, what do you think the question I will ask him or topic of conversation will be? I bet you can't guess. Who said that? That's the right, totally. That's it. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell me about your family. Right? Because er everyone that, you know, so he might be an only child, but he's going to have, I, mean, I, I don't think so. Uh, he's somewhere, their parents, or something happened to them, or they're still around, or cousins. And then we're going to find out, a lot, you know, I, it's really, then you really get to know someone, right? So, um, Geshe Tenge, a really beautiful person and um, smart and dedicated and, you know, kind of with it. But I can almost guarantee he's got a family member that is, you know, if you go out far enough, you know, grandparents or cousins or nephews, and there's going to be stuff he's working with. And then he's got, then I'm pretty much sure he's probably got a family member that goes, well, um, you might be recognized as a master or Geshe or something, but as far as I'm concerned, you're still Bob, you know? <laughs> you know, like that, you know? So uh, when he goes home, you know, I mean, it's, you know, all those kinds of things, but still, uh, you know, we have to make these flexible agreements all the time based on some sense of sacredness. Because of course we want our families to feel sacred. Because like, we're really interested in families for continuity, right? No, it isn't transactional, hopefully not transactional. So we're thinking, well, what, you know, like that. So the tantric system here, um, is actually based on a family system because we say there are five Buddha families and the mandala of the Buddha families operates this way. Um, usually when I've worked at clinics or jobs, I mean, I've worked at some mental health clinics for 
you know, 30 years um, or more. If they say, we're just like family here, I really get nervous. <laughs> I don't want to work here. But uh, we're actually, we're trying to take the family model of closeness and um, continuity and safety and uh, bring it into sanity and enlightenment. So we, we're not trying to say the family system or families or human beings or birth and death or growing up or being a teenager is fundamentally messed up. We're saying, no, the, our biology and our, how we recreate ourselves biologically and how we train kids is um, the Buddha way, but uh, we have to do it from a standpoint of sanity and, and wakefulness. Whereas um, when um, the model, um, which doesn't uh, exist in Asia, the, the unicorn model or the solo, I'm just going to be alone and get enlightened model, that's American. Mm. Okay, that's Western. Even, even uh, if someone's off in a cave or even if someone's very strong retreat, they always have deep connection with the Sangha, with their teacher, with other sentient beings. You're never, there's never this like Lone Ranger or stuff. That, that's very Western and, you know, skis a type all and weird, you know, so uh, we're, we're always connected with some kind of family. And um, as some people know, if you go to a monastery and even, even take vows, um, you don't leave your family. People don't think, people think kind of Christian, they're like, then you're locked behind walls and you never see them again or something. No, I mean, families that are monastery, they're coming and going all the time. And then, you know, of course, you just, you just say, if you're becoming monk or nun, like I'm joining this intentional community, which is a much bigger family. And I can say sometimes more dysfunctional even than your biological family. You know, so you're not leaving, you're still in a very uh, relationship oriented situation. You're just saying, I'm, I'm devoting myself full time to meditation and study and I'm not, that's my job. That's what a monastery or a treat center is. It's not like I'm escaping from the world. No, you, you can't, that's silly. So uh, in Vajrayana or what we call like indestructible vehicle or Tantra or vehicle of continuity, then um, we're, we're looking to have uh, enlightened family systems like that. So when I was studying to be a therapist, I had to pick um, uh, 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 a theory or a way of doing, um, which is not as, as popular now. It's called family systems therapy. So the license is marriage family therapist because the emphasis is on relationship rather than psychologist or social worker or psychiatrist, something like that. <clears throat> Someone in the audience has a balloon on their hand. It is going up, which means Dylan will be following it. And here it goes. Um, thanks, Loma. You sort of touched on this a little bit, but uh, because we're interdependent, one of the things we tend to do is create stories about other people or stories about situations or the relationship. Yeah. So how do we make sure that we hold space for growth or change within that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we become the stories we tell ourselves, don't we? So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> the um they're different styles but uh you know there's recognizing a story is incomplete or false there's adding a true story and then there's liberating all stories so like mahamudra zogchen and is liberating all stories um uh but uh, when we say liberating all stories, it, it just means that um, we're not overly identified with stories because we're always going to have stories. 
just like if you ask a teacher about their family, if they're sane, they're not going to say, I don't have family, right? So, uh, so much of the meditation practice is sorting out our inner stories so that um, they take their place. Uh, so we see which ones are really not helpful, which ones are harmful stories, which are just kind of incorrect, uh, which are maybe good stories where, you know, everything ends okay. And, and then finally see that stories themselves have an illusory quality, right? They're um, by nature lack uh, inherent existence from their own side. So the meditation style we teach here is to teach all the, the those different approaches so that we can sort things out. So um, that's a big part of um, our Dharma path is sorting out the stories without initially like throwing anything out. So it's always dangerous when people want to just throw a story out, even if it's kind of a painful story, because um, painful stories or traumas um, are tricky, aren't they? You know, painful stories or traumas are like um, little birds, right? So, you know, they're, they're also connected to uh, our aliveness and our goodness and sanity too. So if you just immediately say, I'm going to yank that traumatic story out of my head, um, you're, you're going to take some good stuff with you too, right? So there's so much steadiness that goes into like the shamatha, calm abiding meditation and the analytic meditation. So we're not just like digging up an architectural dig with, you know, a backhoe, right? Um, so the most important thing to start with is we we sort out the stories first with some discriminating wisdom instead of immediately just go for that's the story that's going to liberate me or that's the story that's imprisoning me. We create a very open uh, space where we can sort them out. And one way to sort out stories is to listen to other people's stories. So I sit in a lot of groups. I used to teach groups at Sac State. And when people are talking in a group, I can usually identify to some degree to everybody's story. So that helps clarify my own story. Like, oh, there's got that story. Yeah. Okay, that's over here. Oh, there's that story. There's that story. So when um, when the stories have some uh, definition, then and space at the same time, then um, they'll start taking um, you make some choices and then they'll start, they start ordering themselves a little bit. Um, but, you know, I mean, we all, you know, we, we all have like, um, we, we can't, we cannot, this is important, we, we can't uh, scapegoat or isolate the stories we don't like. They just, if that's the tendency, then we get trapped, right? So we have to accept that all kinds of stories are going to come up. Like, you know, every once in a while, I go, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're not, maybe we're not really doing it the temple right, you know. And <laughs> you know, blah blah is not happy, so maybe it's messed up, you know. That's which isn't true. That's very nihilistic, right? Of course, there's some things that are messed up. That's true, right? But you go and go over that. You know, that's my inner idiot, right? So you have to kind of love that and kind of go, thank you, inner idiot, you know? So, <laughs> but, and then, so I recognize, okay, that's, that's a little extreme. That's a little nihilistic, right? So then I generally do, and then say, oh, well, that, that probably isn't true, maybe partially true things, but, you know, um, you know, Ken Sarimshe, Delek was here. I said, oh, this is, this is going good. You know, so I have to like, oh, this really famous habits, things are going great. And that's all. Then, you know, then there's a little bit of correction and then I can, um, then also I can add some more spaciousness to it. So I can say, we can create more. It's not flat, you know, it's not static. So we can say, let's, let's improve this. So the story is, hopefully for me, going to come in to the middle of that. Very important. So 
it's important to know like, well, what stories are very uh, delusional and we shouldn't believe at all. And uh, the ones we definitely should not believe, but we've all had is maybe I'm bad, stupid and wrong and should be dead, right? Other stories probably that also get people in trouble as they are bad, stupid and wrong and should be dead, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we, I really don't want either story, okay? You know, I, I don't want nasty, evil people to be continuing to do nasty, evil things, but um, I'm sorry, I'm not, re I'm, I'm just totally not, the death penalty doesn't work, okay? And I don't think it's a good idea. But I've talked to Buddhists who think, well, it's a good idea because then, <laughs> so, a little side, I think it's a good idea because then you end their life and they get start new karma. I don't know, I, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I have not, you know, because I used to work in the prison for, volunteered Folsom Prison for 10 years and hear a lot and um, meet with lawyers who are trying to get people off a of death row. And the scary part is actually some people that have been on death row have been innocent, right? So, so I don't want, I don't want, I really don't want stories in my head like they should be all be dead or I should be dead. Those are kind of extremes. I want to find a nicer story in between like that. Long, too long answer. I don't know. Helpful. Okay. So I have a question that's going to piggyback uh, off of Ellen's in Mommy Talks, if that's okay. Yeah, so yeah. when your close relationships, uh, when other people's stories and or rules are changing, how do you uh, build a, a solid foundation for yourself of what is true? And like, I don't know, maybe what are some practices to like make sure that your truth is not changing with everyone else's? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's really difficult because um, generally growing up and the way we do things now is we see who we are through others and through the environment, right? You know, that's how we grow up as kids, you know, that our parents say, you're a good kid or you're a nasty kid or you're tall or you're short <laughs> and they're just our mirrors, you know, but um, we do have the capacity there's an independent, uh, and when we say independent, we mean interdependent, independent wisdom called Buddha nature, which has the ability to um, check things out to see whether they're true or not. Um, and if we weren't at, when, if we weren't at the mind, when we say mind, we mean our whole being, our aliveness, if it wasn't able to recognize itself and see its own clarity and witness to that, yeah, we'd be totally screwed. Because then there'd be no way out of the fun house or the house of smoke and mirrors you know there we we have to uh, discover that usually um, through teachings but ultimately we're doing the work ourselves we're kind of going okay I have my own inner mirror and ultimately I have to decide through logic and through experience and through reliable authority too and um, through insight yeah this is this is what's true so the whole dharma practice is you know to find out what's true you know, so um earlier today I said you know the 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 there are the four seals you, you know the four seals are the four affirmations that um you know kind of make you buddhist in a way it's very interesting so it isn't that you believe in you know, <laughs> floating Buddhas or anything, you know, first one is all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, right? So they, they come and go, they arise and disappear. All contaminated or all phenomena that are out of balance through ignorance or greed or hatred are, are going to be suffering, right? Third one is all phenomena, meaning everything. Uh, uh, it does not have a fixed uh, 
our identity is not fixed and, and it is, we don't own it, right? It's a shared awareness. The last one is nirvana is peace. So these are truths like the Four Noble Truths. But, so the whole point is we want peace. We must have peace, but uh, the, the way to get to peace is to be the truth and tell the truth. Oh. <laughs> but it but it's hard, you know, when you you know, because there's uh, people are lying all the time, right? <laughs> so uh, sometimes I joke like I'm as Lama I always try to be truthful, but um uh people go, I don't know, and I and I go, Well, here's the test. I never lie about fashion. <laughs> so if you ask me about do do I think you're you know <laughs> it's just an opinion but you know yeah I'll tell you you know well what do you think of this outfit and you go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> is that helpful yeah yeah but one yeah is one Uh, thank you so much for your um, for your teaching, uh, Rinpoche. Uh, this is more. Is it okay if I just like kind of say something about an experience? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Um, the whole family thing was has been really big for me because um, I just kind of wanted to like get rid of my family. I wanted to just be like, okay, they're not my family anymore, and. Um, you know, because I had just like such a hard time with them. And, um, and so as time has gone on, you know, I still kind of had that feeling I, I couldn't relate to them, I didn't want to be like them, 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 them kind of thing. And then, um, you know, this is this is just kind of an experience that I had that someone might um, think about, you know, in their life or whatever, but my sister got sick, and I hadn't talked to her in years, and um, she had to get a liver transplant, and um, I became the caretaker, um, which was was difficult, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen from that, or whatever, but I just said, yes, I'm going to be all caretake for her, and it just, like, changed my whole life, because I, I was, for once, like, just not thinking about myself, and you know too like she was so she was although we fought we she was still so grateful and i wanted to do it mm. and then so from there you know just recently my mom had a surgery and me and my mom had the have had the most tumultuous relationship and um and in doing that like all i cared about was her well-being and taking care of her and being a good you know nurse and you know and so like I really loved it and it's taught me a whole lot and it's just made me want to like reconnect with my family and um, you know my mom she she called my brother and and she cried to him and she said I forgot what a good person Michelle was mm -hmm. um, you know um, because we have fought so much and so she you know of course she's going to think I'm just like a demon because I was, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I don't know, this just is, it's just, this talk reminds me of this, and it's such a beautiful thing for, um, that I feel inside, and that my family feels inside too, like we're connected again. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to just point out too that the, the four seals, um, uh, for me, they don't feel particularly religious. I'm just curious at people's, yeah, a little scientific. Um, so that's why I hear um, lines are, you know, or I want to have both a strong, what I call a secular um, program or track maybe. And then we, we already have a very strong, but stronger, uh, what I call sacred track, right? But they all come to just realizing the truth. The um, secular Dharma track, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, just uh, realize four noble truths, the four seals. I mean, that see see things as they are. That's that's the goal, right? Things as they are. It's interdependent, and 
um, open and compassionate. That's the way it is. Historically, people have needed a lot of support to stick with it. So I think that's one reason um, religious practices evolved, you know. Um, people needed to be reminded of things, things needed to be passed on that were smart, like our prayers are really guided meditations, right? You know, so um, people needed to be reminded they needed strong um, a positive attachments, sometimes called devotion, you know, strong, realistic, but positive attachments. So a lot of what we see as religion, of course, is not good or um, doesn't seem connected with reality. But if we're doing it here, right, then anything we're doing that looks ritualistic or religious is still supposed to be going towards uh, supporting people seeing the truth of their lives, right? Being able to witness and testify to that means making the lion's roar. So some people don't, they look very non-religious or I don't like all the bowing and I'm not going to call anybody Rinpoche or, or Lama or anything, um, but they might be very interested in just seeing the truth, developing themselves. You know, other people, they're very religious, devotional, and they want to see the truth too. But on both sides, people can be kind of cynical, not see the truth. And they can be outwardly religious, and they're still not interested in truth. So whether we call ourselves, whatever you call ourselves, um, we, we have to see things as they are. There's absolutely no value in calling yourself Buddhist. That's not going to go anywhere. You know, if you don't, you know, like, no one's going to save you, right? Oh, okay, you can come into heaven <laughs> like that. So uh, even though teachers really help out and maybe even celestial beings can help out, uh, we absolutely have to do it ourselves. Absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good news. And we're free, right? Yeah, but the, this is not a salvation um, trip. Yeah, you're not. It's not, someone's not going to, sometimes we talk that way, like Kuan Yin can save, but really we're saving, or Buddhas can save, but it's in parentheses, it means we're, we're, we're saving because we're willing to work on ourselves and benefit others. Yeah, so it, it, it's very responsible, we kind of go, okay, we can do it, and you guys can do it. So maybe one last question or comment, hi. It doesn't have to be the last one. It's funny when I say it's the last one, then finally people like. It. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you, Lama. Um, yeah, it's fascinating to kind of see the change within ourselves. Um, as I've before reacted very much like, well, this is my truth, see my truth, see my truth. And then seeing how like my truth isn't necessarily my truth. My truth is kind of my ego centric wanting to be seen. And as I've been able to see myself, I can see others more easily. And even then sometimes what you see isn't the full picture. It happened very recently where like, I'm trying to create a more peaceful environment with internally and kind of how, how I interact with the people that I love very dearly and trying to keep myself safe in those interactions. And then recognizing like, oh, after the conversation even, or even days after being like, there was more to their story. So it's really, you know, you, you it's what you see and what you kind of, ex you know, looking deeper into it. It's It's just, I'm very, very blessed and humbled by it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <clears throat> of course, you know, we're, we're putting some things into words like uh, Nirvana's peace and um, interdependence and emptiness and stuff. Um, but uh, to see things as they are is uh, an actual experience, right? So um, it, it, 
can't be totally put in a sentence. We can point to it. We can say, you know, please recognize the true nature of mind. Mind here stands for the way things are, the knowingness. The, please, please know that you're knowing. <laughs> please be aware that you, you're aware. You know, so in the higher teachings, we have uh, pointing out instructions and um, uh, do a lot of retreats. So uh, the deep knowing, the deep truths have to be um, uh, lived, not information anymore. So that's why, and um, uh, even in doing the Lojong trainings uh, to develop compassion and equalize ourselves with others, Geshe Tenge pointed out we need a Kalyanamitra, a spiritual friend or a spiritual mentor to help us because um, the capacity for um, getting lost or um, deluding ourselves is, is very strong. But it's always difficult. It kind of begs the question like, well, then how do you find a good spiritual friend, <laughs> right? So the traditions spend a long time on that, you know, oh, what's a good spiritual friend and how do you check people out and so forth. But uh, ultimately, of course, we have to be our own spiritual friend, don't you think? Be our own best friend. So I say Dharma is really a friendship model like that. You know, so but um, the, uh, the higher teachings are the simple teachings, but they're extremely direct, which makes it difficult because um, I, I generally, we're all, we, we know our faults, but when someone's very direct about our faults, it, it always stings a little bit, doesn't it? Like, yeah, I know, but did you have to say it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and also just directly, you know, someone directly pointing out our goodness, you know, is also very tender, you know, sometimes people point out, you know, I point out their goodness or they point out mine. Sometimes we start tearing up, right? You know, because we're so, somebody says, oh, you really, you really are, you, you really do care. We go, yeah, we just melt. So those are direct, what we call pith instructions, you know, that directly introducing the nature of mind. So that's important. So at here, Alliance Sword, we try to have enough safe, we call it safe intimacy, where we can be that for each other, where we can say, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I see that spinach in your teeth, and you're such a, you're such a beautiful person. You know, we we love each other that much. That's the goal. <clears throat> so maybe we should. Uh, there's a. Oh, okay. But you're flashing me the peace sign. <laughs> peace. Hi everyone. Um, Good to see you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk, Lama. Uh -huh. um, it was really um, uh, just to kind of circle back to this uh, discussion of uh, uh, stories. Um, I really like that. Um, mm. I, I I think that maybe probably probably most people have stories swirling in their head out, you know, mm. at all times. Sometimes stories are just thrown on your plate, you know, like. Um, mm. This past weekend, I, or Friday, I got home from work and um, there was a for sale sign where I'm renting. So it's like, uh, so that story is part of my life now. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just wanted to you, you maybe speak on, um, you mentioned about the idea of, you know, we're obviously trying to avoid, you know, delusional stories. And, but maybe something I have, a, it's hard for me, maybe hard for a lot of people, there's maybe a fine line between like an aspirational story and a delusional story, you know, like what, what we, we want to do what we could do and what maybe is not really possible you know like that that's that's, that's tricky right yeah <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> speak about that <laughs> so earlier i mentioned you know that um and our tradition we're, we're very interested in knowing the truth telling the truth but how how do what's our methodology for sorting that out right <clears throat> So sometimes we say there's like, uh, you know, four legs to the table. There's, um, uh, you know, he, sometimes we just say scripture. That's what people have done in the past, right? So there's something to be said about like, well, this worked in the past or this didn't work in the past. This didn't work for anybody in the past. So we also use logic like, well, so why do we think it would work for us? 
So, but there's usually what we call like authority. And then there's uh, what we've heard from someone we actually trust that we can connect with. And then what makes sense, in other words, what's logical actually, through cause and effect or just through logic. And then finally, what our own personal experience is. Right. And then the, um, the <laughs> those are the legs. And then the surface is the one that always like kind of, well, does it work? Is it functional? Because we can have a whole bunch of things and they don't. They're either, when I say it works, does it lead to a good result? So there's a big part of just utilitarian <laughs> pragmatism and dharma. Like, yeah, it looks like it totally makes sense when you're looking at it from the legs. Like, it looks logical. It's been done before. People in authority said, yes, it's my personal experience. But when we put that all together and look at the tabletop, it's a mess. Or just, it won't work. It was a great idea, but it won't work. So we have to put, we have to see all those things kind of level playing field at the same time, or most of the time with ontology and epistemology, <laughs> these big words, we're, we're taking one leg or or we're not interested in a level tabletop where we're kind of like loose, shortening one leg over here and then we put a little wedgie thing over here. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to see everything, you know, all at once. That's the top of the table. Whereas um, most, most of the time with knowing, we, we do things in too linear sequential way. So um, linear sequential has its, it does have, uh, it kind of works in some degrees, like in logic, you have to go, well, if this is the case, then this must be the case and so forth. But um, the Vajrayana way, Buddhist way is kind of in a mandala, like if you saw it all at once, would it be working? Instead of one piece of work and the other is better work. No, it, it all has to like be integrated so um, that, that it has to integrate, you know, so it has to be like an old growth forest, you know, where it's, it's sustainable and alive, you know, and sometimes old growth forests look like not as neat as McKinley Park or, um, you know, a, a formal garden in France or something like that, right? Europe. Anybody been to formal gardens and then just laid out like Versailles or something? Um, and, you know, a lot of times we want an organization or a Dharma center to look like a formal garden and it, or a family for that matter, but it's not going to be that way. It's going to be sustainable. Um, one thing I always ask people like, like, well, if we weren't part of the solution or if we were gone, what would happen? Is it sustainable without our individual. With a business or a family, it might not be to begin with our Dharma Center, but we should be working towards um, a sustainability that doesn't um, uh, eliminate impermanence, right? Because then we're really making a mistake. So that, that's always, there's, in a sense, there's uh, really only, <laughs> this is a little bit of a stretch, but we'd say there's really only one real, um, you know, there's only one or two, <laughs> we'd say one real permanent thing, right? Everything's impermanent. That's composite, right? What's not composite? Yeah, emptiness not. Of course, my, when we say emptiness, we mean awareness, emptiness, you know, you can't, there's not emptiness out there. So if things are made out of parts, they will fall apart, but they can be recreated. So if you have a plan like, well, it'll eventually fall apart, like my car, then I'll get another car, or I'll eventually get tired, then I'll go to sleep, and the plan is, then I'll get sleep, and then I'll wake up, then that's a good plan, right? 
but if you think like I'll stay up forever by taking math or whatever, you know, then that's a bad plan, you know, because you're expecting, you know, per impermanent things to be permanent. So we, you know, these these are some basic truths that we look at, you know, or if we're thinking uh, anything can exist uh, independently from its own side, then we're not so. We have some really smart people. So, can empty is emptiness? Does emptiness inherently exist? One one thousand, two one thousand. Please, someone speak up. So my life will. No, no, can't find emptiness as existing from its own side. Can't. You can't find awareness existing from its own side, right? You can't find it. We're using it, but you can't find it. Where is it? You know. Can't find it, not, not inherently existing. It's scary until you realize, oh, that's what freedom feels like. You just cannot say to people, as my teacher would say, you're 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 inherently free. And I go, well, this is not helpful, Geshe. And I go, you you you're completely free, you know. <laughs> You can do whatever you want. And I go, no, I can't. I you know, so. <laughs> like that. Okay. Is there one last question? I'll make it quick. Um, so just kind of piggybacking off the, the stories, comments. Um, it kind of reminds me of the, the kind of friendship model of Buddhism in terms of like when you're struggling to see the way things really are, I guess how important is it and how do you um, make friends with those inner stories from that outer world you know the inner stories from the simple all the way to the crazy like how how important and um i guess how, how do you begin to do that if the stories are powerful usually you know classically in dharma we're we're going to identify the extremes you know the the extremes are something's always you know something that's composite is always going to be there or something that's composite is never going to be there. So we know that's crazy. So the, the nihilism and eternalism from Buddhist point of view are crazy, right? So on a practical basis, um, you know, we, we just can't kill everybody we don't like. We're just not going to get rid of them. And at the same time, we have to recognize that everybody we don't like or hate or that don't, doesn't like us, right? They're not going to be around forever either. Okay, you know, because in both ways, we, we can't get rid of everybody. But also practically, you know, we can't live with everybody. So we have to create environments where people's individuality, their different Buddha families are respected, right? So, uh, the stories have to have a sorting process, right? That's so we we do have a, a methodology, you know, that's the path it's called that's a methodology. So here's how you're going to sort it out. And the Buddha said, you know, I, I sorted it out this way. I tried the different extremes and, and those just lead to suffering. So I found the middle way. You know, and he didn't express the middle way as everything is separate as some of the Indian philosophers at the time or yogis did. And he didn't say everything is one as some of the Indian systems like Advaita Vedanta do right now. So, and, you know, he just said, everything arises interdependently, which is, you know, sounds great. It's kind of hard to realize because usually we like going to one extreme and the other. So he generally said extreme stories are delusional. You know that, those kinds of things. So we can start there, and then then you kind of work, you kind of work toward the center a little bit. You establish like this. Okay, this, these are the furthest, and then and then you start bringing your your wisdom mind, you know, more more closer like that. But so in our tradition, we like to be we able. To, we say first, sometimes we establish the extremes, we establish the boundaries, and then that lets us shoot for the center. Because otherwise, you don't know what the center is.
So generally we say, okay, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So then you know some something in between has to be the way it is. Because if you establish what's ridiculous, then you won't, the idea is you don't go there anymore. But I know human beings are not inherently logical, so we have to train in it. Because we start thinking, well, maybe the ridiculous is true. You know, I mean, we, we have those kind of crazy, you know, maybe I'll live forever, or maybe I can kill all the Jews, maybe I can kill all the Palestinians, you know, I mean, people, there are people who think like that, right? And it doesn't end up well. So we can't, even our annoying little things, we can't, we can't kill the thought like, I'm going to have a drink. You can't kill that because you cannot kill a thought. But we can say, thank you for reminding me I don't want to drink today or something like that. Or it could be a warning sign like, uh, you know, like sometimes I go home uh, still and I, I'm thinking, it's not like I'm going to have a drink. I was thinking, oh, not recently, actually, I'm thinking, if I was going to drink, this would be the day. <laughs> it's been one of those days and <laughs> like you know like if I was gonna drink this is it <laughs> so that's for me now that's protection right so in a way I'm glad like oh the dash light works right so I'm going thank you because the mind is protecting me so that's that's how protective practice works in Vajrayana like we're, we're befriending the very thing that used to get us in trouble and that's become a protector. Like, oh, so if I was going to drink, this would be the day. It lets me know I really have to, you know, take care of myself, you know, after, you know, a bad day, right? Because things get to me. I mean, when I hear people like wanting to kill themselves, I don't go, oh, okay, well, I'm being paid to listen to this, so it's okay. No, it, it hits you, right? So, yeah, so sometimes it's like, then people are mad at each other, you know, kind of mad at me, you know. Okay, so I just want to go, like, if this is a day to open up a nice bottle of scotch, <laughs> being Scottish. Yeah, but then, it, then I think, okay, this is a day where I really need to do some Dharma practice, take care of myself, right? So it becomes a friend. The idiotic thought has turned into a protector like that. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, so like that. So yeah, so we all have those days and then but we can transform. That's the Vajrayana, it transforms what was once a difficult thought into uh, a positive, you know, a positive protection, right? So I pay attention to it. Like, oh. Okay, I'll just put on sound and music and just go. <laughs> the hills are alive, you know, like that. Okay, so we need to stop here. Let's just do closing prayers, please. merits of these virtuous actions may I quickly attain the state of a guru buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more land encircled by snow mountains you are the source of all happiness and good all powerful generesi tens and gatso please remain until samsara ends Teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. <clears throat> Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel, the snowy land sages, Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. 
Thank you, Patty. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dylan. So um, I think we have some snacks or maybe even a big lunch. I don't know. So I'll be joining people after I freshen up in the dojo. If you want to come, if you haven't met me before, I'll be sitting in the Tara Library in just a few minutes. I like to say hi to people. And you have an announcement. Yes. Sure. Yes. 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 OK. Um, so we actually have the opportunity to help do fundraising for long life prayers for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The Harun Kanzun at Sergei and um, one of the towns around that area are actually hosting um, on October 25th. So we want to raise at least $2,500 um, to help this uh, the prayers happen, which means that it's actually funding for food and tea and bread offerings, as well as um, to help with monks' travel costs to get there. Um, Hardang Kanzan is in Sergei, which is in southern India, and they're going to go up to Dharamsala, not all of them, but a lot of them, um, and to do this. Uh, our uh, resident teacher, Geshe Damshula, is the one who made this request to us, and he's going to be there. And then our spiritual teacher, uh, Jada Rinpoche, is going to actually participate. I think Geshe Damshula has some part in it. I don't know. Um, so I think we have something online set up yet. Uh, or if you do a general donation online, if we don't have an actual drop down box, whether His Holiness Dalai Lama, um, go ahead and just put in the comments what it's for. Or if you want to make a cash donation, that'd be great. Our uh, checks, we can give them to Lama. Um, and then we're also trying to fundraise to help Geshe Damshala do some travel within India. He's currently studying at Gyuto Monastery um, for Tantra College. Uh, and then uh, in November and December, he's going to have the ability to travel around due to his time schedule. Um, and so if we can help him out with that, that would be wonderful. So thank you. Maybe I'll give a little bit background, just one more minute. So um, Dalai Lama's uh, health, I think, a little taking a little dip. So uh, people are concerned. Um, so in the sacred tradition, I think it could be secular too, but sacred tradition. So uh, we we believe that actually making meditation on someone's health and making wishes and sending them, otherwise known as prayers, uh, like work. Uh, and then also when um, people are concerned or worried about someone else's health, it helps the people that are worried to to do practice, right? So we're helping Dalai Lama and helping the monastery, particularly one of the temples there, Hadang said they'd sponsor it. So we're also helping them. So in the West, we would go to therapy and say we're very anxious about someone we love is sick, but the way it works and traditional thing is uh, we say, okay, do a lot of meditation and um, have have some tea and food so and do some prayers feels very sicilian you know <laughs> manja you know manja manja like okay so like that so it's so that, that's a traditional way of supporting uh not only dalai lama and supporting um uh the people that are um concerned right so it's the whole shtick Okay, see you soon. Ciao. Omo araya pazaya na aindi. Om araya pazaya.